Zombie, and to a degree, most post-apocalyptic media tends to have a central theme, hopelessness. The world you once knew is torn from you due to circumstances beyond your control, and you're left in a harsh new world that exists only to torment you, to pin you against others suffering just the same as you. The truth of the matter being that there is no good ending under these circumstances, no end goal than just to survive. But what if... what if there was hope beyond the horizon? And if all you needed to reach it is to share a car with a magical girl, a naked horseman, and Garfield to make it to Canada and blow up the president? Welcome to Death Road to Canada. Hi hi, it's Datachi, and today I'll be talking about an indie game I got back into recently by the name of Death Road to Canada. Death Road to Canada is a roguelike roguelite, Oregon Trail-like co-op zombie survival RPG beat-em-up game developed by Rocket Cat Games and released in 2016. To be honest, I'm not usually a fan of zombie media. I think the setting is often pretty generic and the plots feel aimless due to not having any end goals. But this game is different, and it means quite a lot to me. I first got exposed to it by Vinny Vinesource's streams from like, jeez, seven years ago. Anyway, I've been hooked to this game since, and I'ma tell you why. But first, I think you need the general gist of how this game works. At the beginning of a run of the game, you start in Florida, with two party members, a car, and a dream, to reach Canada, the promised land, free from the threat of zombies. You know, in retrospect, it's kinda typical that Canada is the last remaining nation on Earth. Don't think the Brits would handle something like this particularly well. The game takes place over the course of two in-game weeks, during which you swap between text-based events and real-time beat-em-up sequences as you loot places for supplies. And of course, in traditional roguelite fashion, a total party wipe means the run is over and you've got to start from the beginning. You might be asking, how does the game keep things fresh from run to run? Well, I'd say there's two main factors at play. One is randomness. The locations you raid over the course of your road trip, the different events that play out on the road, and even some of the weirder characters you encounter are random, meaning your runs are unlikely to ever play out the same. As for the other thing I was talking about, that'd probably be customizability. Right out the gate, the game allows you to create custom characters, so you can play as yourself and your friends trying to survive the death road, or create your ex in-game and use her as bait since that's all she's good for. Even more interesting than that, you're able to give the characters perks and traits, which can affect the way they play, interact with events, or even their stats, which I'll get into. Main point here is that in this RNG hellscape of zombies and anime, there's a lot of depth to be found. For example, those character stats I was talking about. Each character in your party has several different stats, which can contribute to their combat ability, such as how much power melee attacks have, how often you can attack before getting tired, or which guns are most effective to use for a specific character. These stats can also give advantages to your group during random events. The thing is, you don't know what a character's stat values are until you're forced to use them for the first time, which leaves a lot of risk in trying to guesstimate who's good at what at first. Managing your team's roles, whether a medic or a bruiser, ends up super important for the survival of your run. Are you willing to risk the life of the only guy who can heal up your party or fix the car? Or will you risk running out of food and letting your best fighter abandon the group? You get awesome decision-making moments like this all the time, and I'd say it's the game's biggest strength. Unfortunately, this level of decision-making can be really undercut by bad RNG. It doesn't happen often, but I've had more than a couple situations where one of my characters was going to die no matter what. Or that I just couldn't get a good weapon in time for the endgame. Not a major issue, but a shame nonetheless. That being said, it's not all doom and gloom on the Death Road. After all, Death Road to Canada is practically a comedy game. Brett, you can't say that. <laughs> this game is oh so stupid, and it just loves to relish in it. Many of the rarer characters are references to other video games, or media in general, or just stupid gags the creators thought would be funny. In one run, a Valkyrie descended from Valhalla to guide my party to Canada. Don't ask what happened to my player character in the next encounter. Anyway, in the same one, fucking Elvis Presley, sorry, uh, Alvis, joined my group and started busting skulls while busting out the moves. Nothing in this game makes you want to feel the weight of the zombie apocalypse, 
The pressure may be. It wants you to get anxious about resource management and the rougher battles, but never any of the loaded junk. It doesn't take itself too seriously. This game is about a group of jerks pursuing the one hope left in the world, whether it takes a few bandit encounters or toilet genies to get there. Also, yes, the toilet genie is real by this game. I think that's the best way to describe this game, though. Based around hope. Something that I've chosen to neglect until now are the zombies themselves. As the, you know, cause of the apocalypse, zombos are representative of the main threat in this world. They're pretty run-of-the-mill, slow-moving googlies who'll touch you up like a Minecraft YouTuber if you get too close and give you a big smooch. Three of those and your typical party member is deadzo. The real threat comes from when they're together as a horde. Because they slow you down when they grab you, some of the endgame challenges become total crowd control nightmares that basically require you to be stocked up on guns and bombs, especially when it comes to sieges. These are semi-common events where you're locked in one small map and are tasked with surviving for a certain amount of time before you can escape, which culminates in some of the most dramatic encounters in the game, specifically the siege in the Lost City and the border of Canada. I think the game sets up its endgame really well, it's a little tropey having the game tell you that you're about to enter the last trading area while the days left to Canada counter hits one, but like, I feel like the fact that you drive through a literal mountain of corpses is never not going to hit. At least for me. Especially with the amount of runs I've had end here. Never feels less shitty. After all, the game makes it pretty clear how many people have attempted the death road before you, but the majority perish before they can reach salvation. But let's say, in spite of everything, you make it to the border. You've likely lost a lot up to this point. You've probably gone through how many bandit checkpoints at this point and been left without a car multiple times. Maybe that fan favorite party member was lost to the horde. So when you ram that car into the mass of zombies at the border and cross over that bridge for the first time, all while the music swells, it's a powerful moment as your final battle truly begins. And then a giant Canada mech drops from the sky to remind you what game you're playing. So, was that really a point to any of that? Well, eh. I do find the hopeful theming of this game really compelling, but I'm not pretentious enough to claim it's the more important element when compared to the game's strong gameplay and killer charm. Although, as one last segment, I do want to sink my teeth into this game's charm and identity more, more specifically its presentation. I think this game's pixel art is great. I think it was the perfect choice for a game like this. I feel like with any other art style, the weight of the situation would be a little too heavy. Here, the pixel art is readable, animated in a cost-effective but still nice looking way and fits the tone. And even then, the simpler art is enhanced by the grain filters and static, making the game almost look like a lost VHS recording. I don't know, it's just fun theming. And then there's the fucking music, which I've been playing it throughout the video, right? You've heard it. This soundtrack is based around a jazzy chiptune sound with a mix of ambient tracks. And one's built for the thrill of battle and chases. Some of my favourites being Rotten Shotgun. Half a brain boogie. And of course, rigor mortis rag.
please listen to this game's soundtrack if you can, it's it's all on Joey Grady's Bandcamp for like three dollars. I'll link it in the description. And that's Death Road to Canada. The game is and will probably continue being a comfort and consistently well-paced experience for me, that I know I'll be coming back to for a long while. The game itself has been receiving consistent updates since its release, even with the creator having other projects in development. Hell, just a few months ago, the newest update to beta was dropped, with new perks and traits and fixes. Looks like we'll have a lot to look forward to. And this is still on top of a base game with several different modes and difficulty options, and events you could go 100 hours without seeing. So, what are you waiting for? Canada waits for no man. We alone can make the choice to make our hopes our reality. Together, it's about time we hit the road. And until then, I'll see you guys in the next one.